atmosphere of regression and fear, of closed borders, of xenophobia rising, hate crime, societies retracting back into themselves, and ever-dwindling disrespect for the other. It is now more than ever that this debate is so pertinent. It is now more than ever that we must encourage cultural awareness, that we must encourage respect for and understanding of beliefs, practices, attitudes, and cultures seemingly different to our own. But we must also encourage self-reflection and inquiry into how our culture, be it English, British, European, or however else you want to dress it up, came to be. Cultural artefacts are a truly fascinating and utterly invaluable tool to this end. Of course, as someone who spends her days in the basement of the Ashmolean Museum with a slightly crazy German professor discussing the significance of the shape of the eyes on Greek portraits, there are a number of things that I do find incredibly exciting about Greek artefacts. Number one, the paths that they allow us to reconstruct of the movements of ancient civilizations. Number two, the images that they create of the practices of the poor, the rich, the noble, the religious, the irreligious, the domestic and public spheres. Number three, the window that they create for us into the past. And number four, and most importantly for this debate, the closeness that they allow us to feel to our ancestors and to the generations that have far gone in the past. The astounding truth that right in front of you, in a case or on a wall, or potentially if you're incredibly lucky, in your very hands, is a relic that has survived hundreds of thousands of years and has seen way more than we will ever hope to see in our lifetimes. But before I get utterly carried away with myself and my love of all things old and crumbly, I should explain why all of this matters to the debate on re repatriation. But I'm going to have some water first. My line of argument this evening will roughly begin by assessing the means by which one might determine ownership of these items, individuals, societies, or otherwise. I will briefly discuss geographical, cultural, and educational claims, as well as paying heed to the importance of adequate infrastructure and security for upholding and keeping such value art valuable artefacts safe. Having established this framework and concluded that the grievances of the proposition are not met by repatriation and the framework to which they have applied their grievances, I will finish by discussing the insidious motives behind repatriation claims and point towards the discord and the international disunity that such claims encourage by drawing the boundaries of cultural property ever tighter. But first and foremost, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce the speakers of the proposition. So you've just heard Ed Evans speak. He's a third year classicist at St John's College and a member of Secretary's Committee, as well as being, quite honestly, one of the loveliest, most incredible, funny, intelligent people I've ever had the wonder to meet. Um, <laughs> his speech tonight has proven all of those things and more, and I can only hope that my speech will be able to live up to just a smidgen of the precedent that you've set this evening, so um, I'd better get on with it. Next up is Wim Pybus, and as a half-Dutch person, I should probably, be, probably know how to pronounce that, but hopefully that was okay. Um, he was appointed the general director of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam in July 2008, and before which he had been the director of the Kunsthal in Rotterdam. During his time in the position, he completely refurbished the mu museum, which, if you haven't had the chance to visit, I would thoroughly suggest you do so, because it's probably one of the most incredible places I've ever been in my life. Um, he also, while he was the general director, launched the Reich Studio, which was an app which offers images of the museum's entire collection to everyone for free. He studied art history, film studies, and philosophy at the University of Groningen, which is actually where my grandparents are from, and we had a nice little bond over Groningen and stuff like that beforehand. Um, He's done a whole load of things with his time. He holds various positions on art advisory boards, societies, he's a television panelist, a newspaper columnist, a children's book author, professor, and terrifyingly overqualified opponent this evening. So from one incredibly well-accomplished person to another, the final speaker for the proposition is Dr. Zahi Hawass. He's an esteemed Egyptian archeologist, 
Egyptologist and former Minister of State for Antiquities Affairs. He attended the University of Pennsylvania on a Fulbright scholarship to study Egyptology, having already earned a diploma in Egyptology from Cairo University. He has taught in Cairo, America, and all over the world. He has held positions of administrator, inspector, chief inspector, and director of the Giza Pyramid Plateau, as well as working on archeological sites in the Nile Delta, Western Desert, and Upper Nile Valley. He was once one of the National Geographic Society's explorers in residence and the Secretary General for the Supreme Council of Antiquities. The list really does go on, and I cannot tell you all how privileged and utterly terrified I am to be speaking against such deceived guests. So, Mr. President, without going on too long about how excited I am to meet these people, these are your speakers, and they are most welcome. Now, to establish a means by which one might determine ownership of artefacts. The most popular approach in recent years has been by geographical location. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is an inherently flawed framework. My foremost argument this evening will be that a call to return the Parthenon marbles to Athens, the Aphia pedimental sculptures to Aegina, and the countless other classical artefacts scattered across Europe to mainland Greece and its islands is to fundamentally misunderstand the ways in which societies have established themselves and grown throughout the years. You must forgive my focus on Greece, uh, for as a Hel Hellenist, it is where the bulk of my knowledge and experience comes. But I will, however, attempt later in my speech to broaden the argument I wish to make in reference to Greek artefacts to other places laying claim to cultural artefacts and calling for repatriation. So the assumption of the proposition that cultural property is part of a national cultural her heritage implies attributions of national character to objects. Now, I don't quite dispute this point. I completely subscribe to the ancient Greek belief that sculptures made in the likeness of a thing encapsulate its essence and can in many ways be seen as a piece of the original. The problem, however, with this argument is that it's hijacked by supporters of repatriation and used as a justification based on ge geography. It connects civilizations by place as opposed to culture, practice, or belief. Notions of cultural identity in the 21st century are incredibly different to those that were held in archaic and classical times. Nowadays, one is Greek if one lives in Greece, the cultural identity being associated to the place. But if one was Greek in archaic or classical times, it was far more an indication of the way of life than it was geographical location. The Greek empire stretched far and wide. For example, we have Sicilian painters adopting motifs from Athenian drama, adorning their vases with scenes of Medea and her children, Orestes, Clytemnestra, Aegisthus, and even the Greek patron of theatre, Dionysus. We have, in Herodotus, a historian of the Persian Wars, an effort to establish some idea of what it means to be Greek. And what he does here is play close attention to religious practices, the establishment of cities and means of governance. If then we adopt this Herodotian view of what it means to be Greek, we are as much Greek as those living in Greece today. European politics, philosophy, science and communications were radically reorientated during the course of the Enlightenment period, roughly from 1685 to 1815, where thinkers, philosophers, artists and writers encouraged education and inquiry. They demanded that their peers dare to know. And in response to this, many of those in positions of authority began to look back to ancient and classical times, belief sets that shaped their societies in order to shape contemporary society. Further, thanks to the wonders of transmigration and settlement over prolonged periods of time, the ethnographical traces of ancient Greeks can be found all over the globe, including here in this very room today. To repatriate. To restore an artifact or other object to its country or place of origin. But this is simply impossible if that place of origin, and by place, I emphasize the importance of place in time and society as well as geographical location, it no longer exists. We are a product of ancient Greek society and as such may lay as much of an ethnographical claim to Greeks' treasures as modern Greeks might. So having explained that intellectual property based upon geographical location is often absurd and that ethnographical arguments are limited in impact based upon migration as well as 
war, societal displacement, resettlement, and other things I just don't have time to go into, how else might one consider ownership? One might be inclined to posture the finders, keepers, losers, weepers argument in my situation. I mean, Lord Elgin found those marbles. Howard Carter discovered the Tutankhamun's temple. They have every right to those items as anyone else does. This argument offers too much of an apology for colonialism, and it's one that I simply am not willing to make. So, how about a merit-based system? How about one where those who have done the most work into conservation of and the inquiry into an item might earn themselves ownership rights? This surely seems fair enough, right? If a society has contributed little to the understanding of its history and the items which that history has produced, why should they have the right to reap the financial benefits of displaying those items themselves? Should it not be the individuals and institutions who have poured hundreds and thousands of pounds and hours into the research of ancient civilizations? Those who have encouraged others to learn about ancient cultures. For example, in the case of the Aphia Temple on the island of Aegina in Greece, an argument for repatriation of the temple's pedimental sculptures from the Glypotech Museum in Munich might be met with laughter. For the ancient site on the island would be nothing without the work of German archaeologists working painstakingly on preserving the Doric columns and uncovering pieces of the two sets of pedimental sculptures that once adorned the building. The site at Afaya is, only incre is also incredibly underdeveloped, and this leads me on to my final potential criteria for assessing the right to ownership of cultural artefacts, infrastructure and resources. The British Museum is one of the largest and most advanced collections in the world, housing more than 8 million different works. It was opened to the public in 1759 and has been encouraging education and open-mindedness of other cultures ever since in the 250 or so years that it's been open. Visitors from Britain as well as places worldwide have been through its doors. Its staff have a detailed understanding of how to look after and preserve artefacts and have carried out fundamental research into ancient civilizations which have been seminal to modern academia. I could say the same of multiple museums and institutions all over the world. Perhaps the Pergamon Museum opened in 1930 or the Neues Museum opened in 1855. The list goes on. They and others have pioneered the dissemination of knowledge and understanding of cultures through time periods worldwide. The sad truth is that there are very, very few places who can boast such claims. In 2002, 56,000 looted Egyptian antiquities were seized in a single operation. On the 26th of April 2016, the National Museum of Natural History in New Delhi and its valuable collection of animal fossils and stuffed animals was destroyed by a fire that could have been pre prevented. In August 2016, Ahmed Al-Mahdi pleaded guilty to leading a group that destroyed most of the architecturally beautiful, historically precious maus mausoleums of Timbuktu. In January 2016, eight museum employees in Egypt came under fire for essentially supergluing back together the beard of the 3,000-year-old mask of Tutankhamun when it came dislodged. Extensive looting and arson still occurs in places like Greece, India, Iraq, and the places that we're hoping to repatriate, repatriate these items to through both negligence and lack of adequate resources. Even if we do concede each of my previous arguments that regard cultural property and how we decide those things, it is thoroughly unwise to allow moralistic arguments of Ed Evans on the side proposition to justify the destruction of invaluable artefacts. So my final argument today is regarding the grounds upon which countries voice repatriation claims. These grounds are not the ones presented to you by the proposition. They might try to convince you by talking about the, atrocity, the atrocities committed by colonial powers. They might try to charm you with moralistic arguments about intellectual property. These are not the motives of the countries looking for their items back. The truth is that these items provide two things. Number one, they provide an opportunity for revenue. And number two, they provide an opportunity to draw clearer dividing lines between civilizations. On the first point, it is indeed true that artifacts obtained during colonial rule are an important pull factor to Western galleries and museums. Oh, there's a fly. Um, but we must question who will be profiting from their return. Will it, re will it really be a triumph for broader education and the empowerment of the marginalized nations? 
or will it allow the powerful and elite of said countries to profit from these artefacts? How can we ensure that in the countries where the circles of power are potentially even more narrow and exclusive than in the UK, the benefit is shared? On the second point, linking back to the point that I earlier made on this in, during my speech, calls for repatriation undermine the global society in which we live. They draw finite lines between different nations and localised culture. They do not encourage us to look outwards but look inwards, and they prioritise a parochial view of history and civilizations. I haven't had the time to touch upon a vast number of other problems with this motion that I'm sure my esteemed teammates will be covering later. For instance, the problem that hailing repatriation as atonement for colonialism completely undermines the scope and depth of its effects. Perhaps the problem that repatriation necessitates generations to be held accountable for the actions of their predecessors. Or perhaps the problem that pretty much the entire history of the world up to now, and including now, has consisted of groups of people dominating other groups, and of people dominating other groups by force. This is no, in no way unique to the West. I hope that my arguments have presented to you this evening that this, this motion is completely reckless. How it undermines rights to proper conservation, preservation and public access of invaluable historical artefacts and how, most importantly, that it divides an increasingly divided global community even more. Please vote opposition. Thank you.